Okay, no problem. Well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, having us. Yeah, so we're a group of startups and maybe a few a few words to set the stage here. So CPO, it's a, it's really more of an architecture term that's uh, that's used that has different meanings. Um, there is a technology, often CPO, uh, people use it synonymous with silicon photonics approach, even though silicon photonics can, is a technology can be used in different configurations, including pluggables. And uh, we are the the old man out here, someone has to do it, uh, of the of all the four companies here, we're the ones that actually use micro LEDs. And the main reason we do that is energy efficient links um, for short distances, which is exactly what scale up needs. If I, unless something drastically changed in the last few weeks, I think my other three colleagues here will then speak to silicon photonics based CPO architectures. So I'll leave it at that for the introduction. Let's dive in if I can have the next slide. And I'm not going to dwell on this long. This is just our view on why energy efficiency is important, given that the IT industry is consuming an ever greater uh, share of the world's energy energy consumption. Projections go beyond 20% by 2030. And the other one is our view on why interconnects all of a sudden become the, uh, the hot commodity. When you look at how uh, we, we use this for illustration. We're using here the uh, the NVIDIA HPM bandwidth <clears throat> at the bottom. And uh, if you compare that to the number of parameters in large language models, which which kind of scale with the compute power that you need to process these language models, how how much that uh, gap has increased by by orders and orders of magnitude just over the last few years. But I think we're all on the same page. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be on this webinar. So we can go right to the next to the next slide, still setting the stage. Uh, in there are basically three network segments in AI that um, can use different interconnect technologies. There is the interdata center, those are the transport networks that we're all familiar with. Some of us have worked on these networks for uh, more years than we care to admit, including myself. Um, traditional optical technologies, this is all but dominated by optics. There's a logo of RF in that. Uh, then there, in inside the data center, there's two groups. There is the scale out that's also been mentioned today. So that's when you when you network multiple computers. Uh, that technology is also mostly optical these days because it's just it's just a matter of reach. Uh, lots of traditional technologies and the initial CPO deployments look like they're going to aim at this. There's that uh, includes Nvidia. That also includes uh, Broadcom. And then we have scale up, which is basically making the computers bigger. And that's uh, simplistically saying networking GPUs by connecting GPUs to other GPUs, usually with a with a, a, a single layer switching fabric, because multi-layer switching fabrics would have too much latency. And that's exactly where we are aiming with our low energy technology. Uh, that's today dominated by copper, even though we just heard that there is a few there are a few applications for optics already in the scale up domain, but it's it's rare. It's it's heavily dominated by copper because it works, it's cost effective, and uh, the reaches so far have been limited. But that's where everyone would like to go now is to longer reaches to build bigger computers to get even more compute power. With this, we'll go to the next slide. That would be building if it were just a PowerPoint presentation. I understand we don't do that today. So let me just walk you through from left to right. Um, I assume that some of you have attended a great workshop uh, this past OFC. This was uh, on Sunday, hosted by NVIDIA, specifically Trey Greer, great engineer from NVIDIA. And he basically boiled the key specs for a scale up network down to five line items which are listed here so energy efficiency he said much less than five picojoules per bit he didn't say a specific number we sometimes say uh, we should hit one picojoule per bit shoreline density he put out there make it make sure that it's at least a terabit per millimeter uh, if not better reach he said you don't need more than 10 meters uh, I know there are other specs floating out there. I think a group of hyperscalers have come up with 20 meters, but it's in that in that ballpark. 
Reliability, this first time I saw a reliability target officially in the public domain of 10 fit, which is an order of magnitude better than existing pluggables. They're typically in 100 to 150 fit. It's not quite in the league of copper, which uh, can easily get to one fit depending on the technology. And then you also put a cost target out just to uh, to make sure that we uh, we feel the pressure here in the optics community. And that's 10 cents per gig. Optics typically today are in the 50 cent per gig and, and up, up to a dollar per gig for some of the technologies. In the copper domain, of course, they, they are basically in this range already, and that's where the target comes from. Um, I think we can interpret this as we have to, we, we have a, an, an upper bar, so we have to duck below the 50 cents per gig. I don't think we need to hit 10 cents in the first uh, the first day of deployments. But that's where people want to go. And the faster we can get close to that, the 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 faster, the steeper the ramp will be of optics and scale up. I'm going to now go to the middle column where it says light bundle. Light bundle is what we call our technology. And basically just answering um, NVIDIA's um, challenge to the industry by going down the, the line items. So we have demonstrated one picosol per bit actually below that. We use NRZ format, so we use what's often called uh, wide and slow. I'll get into more detail in a moment. These are very new results. We can do the terabit per millimeter because we have a 2D, uh, 2D array. So we can build the array away from the, the shoreline, if you like, and that helps us with increasing, increasing density. The reach 10 meters, definitely, yes. We have shown up to 30 meters, but that usually requires a bit of conditioning using either different fiber or um, using uh, equalization or dispersion compensation or a combination. Reliability, uh, well, we haven't deployed a massive volume yet of our technology, so we can't really answer the a fit. We can't give a fit number yet, but we're off to a good start with gallium nitride LEDs because gallium nitride LEDs are... As, it, as an LED, as a chip, and I know this is about the interconnect, not just the chip, but the chip itself is super reliable. And that's one of the reasons uh, LED lighting has taken over the lighting industry in the last five years. Uh, temperature range, uh, we are looking and getting asked about mil spec in some applications. This is obviously not for data centers, but, but it is, um, it is a, a very robust technology and it's cost effective and again, courtesy of the lighting industry that has driven massive, uh, massive volume and uh, optimized transfer technologies and such. What you can do with it, uh, don't know how well people can see this on this slide, but you see an exploded view in the top right corner. So basically what you have is you have an array of LEDs that are grown on a sapphire substrate and then flip chip transferred and bonded to a CMOS. Each LED gets a uh, a dedicated driver in the CMOS. You couple that light via a lens array into a fiber bundle, travel through the fiber, get down on the other side with via another uh, lens array. You focus it on a, a PD receiver, and uh, that is your that consists of, that makes up your link. If you need high speed service, which of course. Um, we need uh, today to fit into the existing ecosystem, even in scale up. Uh, most people use the 200 gig per lane architecture that we've all uh, come used to come used to in the from the Ethernet world. It's NVLink uses the same granularity as does Infinity Fabric, uh, as does and some people use actually Ethernet or InfiniBand for this architecture. The reason being mostly that this 200 gig phi is very well understood, has been deployed massively, and people trust it. As long as we need that, we of course need to take our slow and wide architecture of a few gigabits per lane uh, up to 200 gigabits per lane, and for that you need a high-speed interface. That's typically done in an N3 node, so that's a, that's a uh, an advanced node for energy consumption reasons. The, N, the, uh, the other two, the transmit and the receive chip, are done typically in N12. Chris, what you can... sorry, sorry for interrupting, but <clears throat> how much um, um, how much that service chip uh, would contribute to the power consumption? That's an excellent question. So the so that is today a um, 
a 200 gig service that brings it all the way down to four gig per lane, which is what we're using in the first generation. That is right on the order of, uh, of four to five picojoules per bit. So unfortunately, fact of life, the if you include the surges, then we're right back with everyone else at roughly five picojoules per bit for a uh, for an end-to-end -end link, of which the optical front end is uh, is uh, one picojoule, and then the other four to five picojoules are burned in the high-speed surges. If mm -hmm. and when the industry, and I think it's a when, not an if, goes and adapts uh, these wider and slower chip-to-chip -chip interfaces like a UCIE, uh, that would change. Then that comes down to more like another picojoule. So then your whole link would be end-to-end -end with the surrogate speed on the order of two picojoules per bit. But that's a very good question, Vlad. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the, the only other message here is now, what do you do with this technology? Uh, you can use, you can package this uh, into what some people call OBO, onboard optical module. That means you keep the optical interface outside the package with a GPU and uh, HBM module. So that's that that's what's on the, uh, so so the the GPU and the HBM modules would be on a silicon interposer in a package with a stiff in the ring that you can see here. And the optical interface stays out of that. Now, a lot of people would that uh, will call that already a CPO. But then what we consider a true CPO approach is when you go inside the package, which of course is a much bigger, it's the most efficient way uh, to do this, also the most cost effective, but it requires a joint design. That is not a step that any uh, any large GPU designer will take first time with a, uh, with, with a new technology. So we're fully aware of that. That's why the first development will be an OBO or possibly a uh, an AOC development where you use the same optical components. With it, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the next slide. And I think a lot of you have probably seen this chart, but it's always good to, to sort of take an, a different view and see how the LED and micro LED technology stacks up to the uh, other interconnect technologies. This is originally a DARPA chart, came from Gordon Keeler. Across the bottom, the x-axis, you have reach of a link. So starting way on the left with very short distances and then going up to um, a, a thousand meters or a kilometer on the right. And on the y-axis, you have a figure of merit that consists of bandwidth density and energy efficiency expressed in the, uh, in the units uh, shown here. And basically what you can see, so in the, ref, in the left hand side, when you're in the package, copper uh, electrical interfaces will keep dominating. When you go all the way to long distances, as we all know, then it is optics, it is traditional optics and obviously significantly less efficient, but you get that uh, massive reach. And the question is, it's already come up before, so what's the transition going to look like to go from copper, which today is still used up to about a meter going forward when we know that copper cannot reach beyond that? And copper is also struggling with the uh, the bandwidth, and that's where the LEDs can make a, a fundamental difference by being both dense as well as energy efficient. So our sweet spot, I if I would have to put numbers on it, would be from about a centimeter to about ten meters. Again, we, we've already shown thirty meters, but that uses a slightly modified fiber, um, and that uses uh, some other. Um, conditioning of the signal that comes at the expense of some energy efficiency. I think I'll leave it at that with this slide and slide and go on to the next one. So these are the latest technical achievements. They came fresh out of the lab, literally in the last two weeks. Uh, we have we have said for a while now that uh, the LED is actually only a part of the story. It's really the end to end link. You need to have the right fiber, fiber bundle and the better the responsivity of your detector, and we're talking blue light here, so this is slightly different. These are actually silicon detectors. That helps. But the better the responsivity, the, the lower the power of your LED, the lower the overall link, but you need to have those detectors uh, work well. And we've just had a couple, I would call, uh, breakthroughs. We've managed to build internally more advanced, higher responsive uh, detectors as well, and again, some of you might have seen the announcement, we're now working with TSMC. They're adapting their CIS, so camera image sensor process, for our high-speed uh, high uh, LED signals 
And that, of course, has two advantages. You can see it's very efficient. So we can now show this is an individual link, just for full disclosure. This is not a this is not a cluster yet that comes next, but an individual link we've just shown, you can get down to 2.2 picojoules per bit for a transmitter and still close a link at 10 to the minus seven bit error rate, or if you want 10 to the minus 12, then it's about 0.3 picojoules per bit. So it's definitely comfortably sub picojoule per bit efficiency. Now that needs to get scaled, but that is that is definitely um, one thing that makes this technology very attractive to a lot of uh, um, a lot of entities that are looking at this. I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so again, that would build, but uh, here it is. What are we doing? The first thing that comes is now our next gen full demo kit that uh, will 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 build a full 800 gig demo link end to end over 10 meters, and then out of that, that comes so that comes later this year, and then. Beyond that, we can either go the OBO route or we can use the same building block and put it into an active optical cable, which we wouldn't sell. We would supply that to OEMs. And beyond that, using the same building block for now, uh, there is a lot of talk about uh, sort of a next generation of optical high density pluggable connectors. There is a big effort in OIF. There are also some efforts directly by individual companies who have done this before, who don't want to wait for the uh, the standards process that some people consider a bit slow. But these are the different uh, the different uh, products that you can yield out of this technology. The next slide, please. Yeah, that's just a, a quick. Uh, so, what would what would be the advantage? Why would you make a, a an AOC one point six gig uh, tera? Sorry, one point six tera Ethernet AOC when we already have many technologies that can yield that. And again, the answer to this is energy efficiency. As you can see, less than 10 watts per endpoint for a 1.6 tera Ethernet link. And uh, the other being cost. You can, again, slot this between your, your copper AECs and your full optical AOCs, which arguably can go beyond 10 meters. But most people don't really deploy AOCs beyond about 10 meters anyway. Next slide, please. So I hope I've been able to uh, convince the audience here that there is a, there is definitely an interesting new technology. Um, and I just see a spelling mistake. This should be micro LED interconnects. This is not a new type of interconnect that we created here. Again, one picojoule per bit efficiency as a benchmark, one terabit per millimeter density as a benchmark. About 10 meter reach can be extended if you're willing to trade off some energy efficiency and an operating range that, uh, if needed, can go into the mil spec range. So way beyond anything that's typically used in communications. With this, I'll turn it back to you, Vlad. Thank you. Or sorry, actually, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Chris.